With all due respect, your ex is a great looking woman. I'm sure she has someone new. What? No. Don't you even joke about that. Reggae music make you dance and reggae music make you smile. I've been skanking to the rhythm from my was a little child. Welcome back. Now, as we enter the home stretch of the campaign season, questions abound as to whether Kenyans will have a free, fair and credible election. Since 2007, public confidence in the integrity of the electoral process has been waning. Well, does Kenya have the capacity to conduct free and fair elections? Well, does Chapter 6 of the Constitution define the standards for leadership and integrity? And how do Kenyan citizens put integrity at the head of this election. Those are some of the questions we will be looking at tonight on the Voters Hub. Let me introduce my guests really quickly. To my far left, we have Sheila Masinde, Transparency International Executive Director. And we also have to my right, Eric Ngumbi, Head of Corporate Affairs and Communication at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, as well as Commissioner Juliana Cherera, Vice Chairperson of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. Uh, thank you all for joining me. And I think before we begin the conversation, I'd like to play a bite of Dr. Fred Matiangi at uh, a National Council on Administration of Justice forum uh, over a week ago, where he made some revelations on the caliber of candidates that will be running for office. Take a look at what he had to say. The amount of money being spent in the campaigns out here is incredible and totally crazy. We are going to have an unprecedented case of voter bribery in Kenya during these elections. And as I've said before, and I'm not shy to say it here again today, uh, if we are not very careful as a country, we're going to launder into elective institutions, drug dealers, uh, criminals of unprecedented standards. And in some constituencies, the people we are profiling or we are investigating, or the people on Mr. Kinoti's radar, are the leading candidates in, in some constituencies and in some areas. All right, some very serious um, revelations there from the Interior Cabinet Secretary. Let me begin with you, Eric, from where you sit at the EACC. What kind of integrity vetting do we need to start seeing during this election season? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. First of all, I want to agree uh, fully with uh, what uh, the CS has said. It is indeed true that uh, if we are not careful as a country, we are likely to have uh, a gang of individuals who uh, face all manner of uh, criminal charges, people who are drug dealers, murderers, and the thieves uh, occupying public office. That means that uh, when it comes to uh, election in August, citizens must be very, very careful as they choose their leaders. You have talked about uh, vetting. This vetting relates to integrity, integrity being uh, what chapter six of the constitution is all about. When uh, we are talking about integrity, we are talking about um, uh, quality or character that uh, is uh, in accordance with what uh, has been prescribed under chapter six of the constitution and the leadership and integrity act. An individual who has not engaged in uh, abuse of office, an individual who has not embezzled resources, but there is a challenge. Uh, people talk about chapter 6 of the Constitution, and indeed uh, when uh, Kenya enacted the Constitution in 2010, we intended to reverse the culture of, uh, the culture of impunity and corruption. Right. So that is what chapter 6 was meant to address, but we are yet to realize the fruits of chapter 6 of the Constitution because of what has been termed as uh, gaps in the law. So that means that as we go to uh, the elections, the citizens have a key responsibility to do the vetting. ESEC will do its part, IBC will do its part, but citizens have the ultimate responsibility to do the vetting because they have a, a very powerful and an impeachable tool called the vote. Vote out those who do not have integrity and we know them. And those who are facing charges in court. And before we get there, you know, the sieving of organizations like yours, EACC and IEBC, are extremely important before we even go to the ballot or the vote on election day. And, and for you, Commissioner, you know, I heard your CEO the other day saying Chapter 6 is not ornamental. It needs to be implemented. From where you sit, you know, why are we seeing some of these characters being cleared in some cases? Okay, uh, thank you, Victoria, for inviting us to this uh, very important topic. Yes, indeed, uh, IBC is guided by the law. 
And uh, in clearing of candidates, we follow the law. We follow the Constitution, we follow the Election Act, and any relevant law. So with that, uh, we are bounded by the law, basically. But we work in conjunction with our stakeholders, like the ESCC, we work with the ODPP office, and uh, any relevant body that is able to give us information about individuals. Then we sit down and we look at the reports and now decide, has this person contravened the law that is, uh, we are supposed to be guided off? And then finally, there is something that now ties everything together, that uh, we cannot disqualify someone unless they have exhausted all the appeal mechanisms. So there uh, is the catch. So those are some of the loopholes that some of these people are using. You know, Sheila, from where you sit, you heard Eric talk about uh, citizens using their vetting power in terms of the vote. Mm -hmm. There's the laws and different loopholes that Commissioner talked about. But what standard of integrity is required under Chapter 6 of some of these candidates that will be going out to woo voters during this campaign season? <clears throat> no, Chapter 6 is very quite clear on the kind of leadership that Kenya requires. If you look at Chapter 6, Article 75, uh, which 73 rather, which talks about you know what leadership is. It is a public trust, you know, and then requires that anyone who is occupying that place of leadership, you know, is someone who should act in a manner that does not demean, you know, the public office that they serve, you know, in a manner that honors and um, brings respect to that office. But we are seeing the contrary, where in fact Chapter Six has been observed more in breach than in compliance. If you look at uh, what has happened in the past five years, but if you look at what happened in 2017 because of our failure to vet and sieve out um, leaders who had been accused, implicated of corruption and other uh, serious offenses, and even uh, people who had been accused of other ethical uh, breaches. Um, because we failed in 2017, that is the reason why this problem has snowballed, where we are now having, you know, you had uh, Interior CS speaking about 40%. I, I think that 40% is what we are looking at now in terms of the people who are occupying public office, looking at the cases that ESCC, Eric, and, and his colleagues have had to Pambana Nayo in, in the last, in the last uh, five, 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 five years. Uh, because we failed to do what was meant to be done at that point, we allowed them into office. And they got more opportunities, you know, to mm. put their hands into the, into the big cookie jars and commit more crimes. In fact, if you look at the list, there's a list that ESCC had in, in, uh, and presented to IEBC of 106 candidates uh, who had issues, who were either being investigated or who had been taken to court, but nothing was done of those 106 names. Um, if you go back to that list, many of them are now in court or being investigated by Eric and team for new cases. So they got opportunity. So we risk now, if we don't do anything about it within the next two months, we risk having people who have already committed uh, cases, uh, uh, offenses, uh, even committing more crimes once in office. And when you look at the, 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 the state of the economy, right. you know, we're caving under public debt, the rising cost of living, it is because we have allowed those people to sit into office. So if we don't deal with chapter six now, we are actually going uh, to cave and even more as a country uh, because of our failure to act against the corrupt. So, so practically speaking, you know, Eric, what then can be done? You know, what Sheila was talking about in the next two months, we need to clamp down on some of these individuals. How do we do that, essentially? Uh, Victoria, um, let me say something about the vetting and then uh, I, I will say what uh, we as ESEC think needs uh, to be done. First of all, to uh, ensure that uh, people assuming office are clean people who are going to take care of our resources, the vetting has to start at uh, the level of the political parties. Parties have the obligation to nominate people who are clean and who meet the integrity standards that are set. This is because uh, under the Constitution, implementation of Chapter 6 is the responsibility of everyone. That is what Article 3 says. Then the second level is uh, the IEBC and ESCC. These are the institutions that are mandated to do that. Uh, where ESCC and uh, IEBC have not uh, been able to do it thoroughly due to the gaps in the law, then the third level comes. That is the citizen, because the citizen has the vote. So. IBC submitted to us yesterday a list of uh, 20,958 aspirants who are seeking various positions. As we speak, our teams are actually going through our database. 
we are uh, generating a report giving uh, the integrity status of each of those persons. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are finding very interesting things. There are people who want to become governors and uh, despite the fact that uh, the constitution and uh, the applicable statutes require that they have degrees, they don't, but they have miracle degrees. <laughs> so the gap in the law is that um, people want to uh, argue that they have been uh, not uh, taken to court, they have not exhausted appeals, etc. We have seen other cases where people have uh, charges, bad charges if I could say, and yet people are seeking to get to office from which they have already been um, charged or removed right. to do the same things that uh, they uh, have done initially and removed from the office. So we are asking citizens to be vigilant. We are asking uh, the courts, and this is very important, we are asking the court to determine the cases that have been uh, filed before them so that they clarify the integrity threshold. You know, Victoria and uh, Tim, uh, the problem we have uh, under the implementation of chapter 6 is that uh, there are different interpretations. People interpret chapter 6 based on what benefits them. Mm. So because of those different interpretations, mm. courts come in now to tell us what the integrity threshold is. So we have multiple cases before courts and we hope the courts will give us uh, a decision in good time so that it is clear for the country who qualifies to buy and who does not. We urge the court to give us that decision so that it benefits the process. Because if that decision comes after the elections, then it will not. Uh, so, from what you're saying, the pressure now or the process. ball is in the court of the courts. Yes, the indeed. Mm -hmm. The focus was, has been uh, on IBC and the ESEC. We are doing uh, what we must do, but it has now shifted to the courts. Courts need to interpret the law, Chapter 6 of the Constitution, and unlock the integrity threshold that has been uh, uh, undetermined for quite some time. And before I come to you, Commissioner, I want to go to another bite, actually, from the IABC Chairman Wafula Chabukati at the same forum that uh, Dr. Matiangi was at, and just talking about some of the challenges when it comes to addressing electoral misconduct. Take a look at this. Compared to 2017, where we managed to contain political temperatures, stop candidates from tearing each other's posters, harassing each other in campaign venues, we were, our teeth were removed. We don't have any teeth. So, Commissioner, <laughs> when you hear your chair say our teeth were removed, what was he referring to? What, what teeth uh, were actually extracted? Uh, you remember we were doing the enforcement of the code of conduct and uh, we started summoning uh, people who were having hate speech. Mm. So uh, in the process we were given a court order to stop and uh, the matter was taken to the ODPP's office. So as we speak we can no longer <clears throat> summon anyone. When we hear hate speech, we take it to ODPP and we take it to NCIC. So that's why the chairman is saying that we don't have teeth. And um, with that, at least the two things that we did, mm. it calmed the temperatures. It calmed the temperatures of the country. People did not want to dare to have hate speech. And I think it was a good thing. And now ODPP, it's good because he has the power to investigate. So with that, when we have the evidence, it can be taken to him and it is prosecuted. And yes. Sheila, let me bring you in. We're running out of time, but just to get your take, and I just want to put the question that I kind of fielded at the beginning of my intro, which was how do citizens mm -hmm. put integrity at the head of this election? So essentially, mm -hmm. what's their role now? Mm -hmm. Of course, as citizens, we expect citizens to come together, unite, and reject any person who has been implicated mm -hmm. in, a, uh, in, in a corruption case or any other criminal offense or any other ethical issue. We expect that they will say an outright no to them. I think we have seen the opposite um, in previous elections, where instead these people are glorified rather than stigmatized, but we need them to actually reject these people outrightly. As civil society, we're in various efforts. We're actually conducting social vetting exercises and providing forums for citizens to be able to assess all these people who are seeking their votes and claiming that they can be able to deliver on the various mandates of the elective seats that they are sitting. And I know there are various other initiatives at the community level with residential associations. I, I belong 
belong to Langata constituency and I know we have an effort towards interviewing all candidates at the constituency and at the ward level. I've seen other efforts in Kilimani, Kileleshwa, and, and we are supporting other efforts up country. And those efforts need to continue so that citizens are actually vetting these people and asking them direct questions, even in regard to issues around Chapter 6, their integrity, their character, uh, and, and their competence. Let me deal with something or rather comment on something that Erica said on that we are looking at the courts. Indeed we are. Even as civil society, we have presented a couple of courts seeking interpretation on Chapter 6. For instance, who is the right um, institution who should be declared the, the, the custodian of, mm. of Chapter 6. You know, our reading of, uh, of Article 79, we believe the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission should be the one actually has been given the mandate to ensure compliance and enforcement of Chapter 6. And so we, we, we I know that has been one of the gaps. Who outrightly is responsible for this? Because sometimes there's a back and forth. Who's responsible for vetting? Who's responsible for clearing? But we, want, we, are, we, are, we, are, we have taken that matter to the court and we hope that we can be able to get that direction and clarity. Uh, among other issues we're also seeking is the, the, the question around um, the, the ethical and also moral standards in regard to Chapter 6, because right now we are looking at the criminal standard. Mm. But there are some issues which are not really of a criminal nature, yeah. but they speak to the ethical uh, they, they speak to ethical issues, which might not necessarily end mm -hmm. up in court or be prosecuted, but then they tell you of a, of a person's character, mm -hmm. you know, someone involved in fights and so on. And I think in 2011, we set the Chapter 6 standard so high. Remember when the former Deputy Chief Justice uh, was re 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 left office because of simply pinching, not simply, but I mean, just pinching a nose, which of course was in disregard to someone else's rights. But we actually was actually removed from office for pinching a nose. But now we are having people who have been accused of murder people who have been accused of grand corruption, theft, and other serious offenses who continue to remain in office and feel that they have a right to continue to contest, yet they have committed very, very serious uh, offenses. Mm -hmm. So what really is our standard in regard to Chapter 6? We have to really uh, uh, get it right. So as civil society, we've taken that, that, that mantle and we'll be seeking uh, the direct uh, you know, direction from the, from the court. And also we have also taken some, some cases also against individuals who we believe should not be cleared to vie for office because they've already been impeached. Because once you're impeached, Article 75 of, the, of Chapter 6 is very clear. You have technically been removed from office. So if you've been impeached from you know, Nairobi, you know, Kiambu governor position, you can't now say you're coming to Nairobi or go, you're going elsewhere. You have been impeached, you've been removed from public office. It right. is all public offices. Even an MCA, you can't vie for that. So, but we are, we are, we are, we are because that matter is under the court, we wait to seek direction uh, from the court, but we continue to take our responsibility uh, uh, to, to ensure that certain things are done correctly. Okay, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Sheila, Commissioner, and Eric for coming in and shedding more light on this issue and also what citizens can do in terms of keeping those who will be vying for their votes come August 9th accountable. Let's take a short break here on Citizen Weekend. Much more ahead, including...